Hello, my name is Peter Dodek, and I am a physician, a doctor, and a professor of medicine at UBC in Vancouver. And I'm happy to share with you a little bit about my career as a physician and a researcher in medicine. So when I was in high school, similar to where you are now, many of you are now, I had no idea what I wanted to be. But I did know that I was interested in science. And so I took science courses, uh, chemistry, physics. I never took biology in high school though, uh, because it was um, mostly memorizing and not really, didn't really have a great reputation, unfortunately. Anyway, um, I also took other courses like graphic arts and acting and electives just to balance out what I was doing in science. After high school, I went to UBC for my undergraduate education and there I was interested in chemistry. I'd had a chemistry set as a kid and I was interested in chemistry. But after first year of chemistry, I decided maybe I'll check out biology to see what it's like. So I took a summer course. It was about six weeks, uh, a whole year's course in six weeks, and I loved it. I had a fabulous teacher. He wasn't actually even a PhD. He was, had a master's degree, but he was an excellent educator. And he turned my life around from being in chemistry to biochemistry. And so I studied biochemistry for my undergraduate career at UBC. And then as I got closer uh, to the end of that, in my third year, I found out that biochemistry at that time didn't necessarily lead to a job. People who had graduate degrees and even postgraduate training in biochemistry uh, weren't able to get jobs in that area. Now that was in the 70s. Things have changed since then, but uh, that made me think, well, what else could I do? And so I started to think about medicine. Maybe I'll apply to medical school. And uh, so it was really kind of an afterthought, and I don't mean to be cavalier about it, but I wasn't really that excited about it, but I thought I'd prepare for it. And so I applied to medical school, and I was fortunate enough to get in to medical school. I was accepted both at UBC and at University of Toronto. Now, I'd never been to Toronto, and uh, but I knew that it would be kind of refreshing to go away and do something different in a different city. And indeed it was. And that has been another theme of my career. One is great mentors like my biology teacher, and two is going away for different parts of my career. So this time I did go to Toronto and I went to medical school there and it was a huge amount of work. A lot of material to, to memorize and to learn, a lot of concepts learning how to take care of patients but you know I still wasn't sure that I wanted to be a doctor in fact I thought maybe I would take that education and go back and get an education degree and teach biology in high school to make it more interesting than it was in my high school anyway um, once again another person influenced me I had a teacher an internal medicine specialist in Toronto who was my teacher in third year of four and he got me so excited about internal medicine. Now internal medicine is a lot of things, uh, but I'll tell you what it's not. It's not surgery, it's not obstetrics, it's not pediatrics, it's not psychiatry. It's pretty much everything else. It's all the diseases that people have. Brain diseases, skin diseases, liver diseases, lung diseases, heart diseases, kidney diseases, many things. And so I decided that I would uh, uh, forego being coming a high school teacher and pursue a career in internal medicine. So once again, I decided it would be a good idea to go somewhere else. This time, I had an opportunity to do an elective in my fourth year of medical school, my final year, and I did it in California at one of the UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles hospitals. This was a county hospital that served poor people most people didn't work, um, and many of them, in fact, weren't even uh, registered citizens of the United States. But it was important to care for everybody, and that's exactly what happened there. I was very fortunate uh, to do the elective there for a month, and then I applied there to be a resident. That's what you do after medical school, residency, postgraduate training. 
and my residency was in internal medicine. That was three years. So after three years of undergraduate at UBC, four years of medical school, now I was embarking on another three years. This sounds like a lot, but you know, as time goes along, things speed up. I'm sure you'll, you will find that as you go through school. And once again, during my residency, I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted to do because there are subspecialties of internal medicine. I mentioned all those other areas, kidney disease, lung disease, heart disease, and I enjoyed uh, mo almost all of it. But you know, I had another wonderful mentor, the director of the intensive care unit. That's the place where the sickest people in the hospital are, was a fabulous teacher and a real inspiration. Not only was he very organized, methodical, because these people, these patients are very complicated uh, in the way that he uh, did rounds, that is reviewed patients every day, but he also had incredible compassion and caring for the patients and for all of the staff, nurses, doctors, everybody, because it's a real team that works in the intensive care unit. It's not just one person taking care of one patient. And I decided then, after my three years, or near the end of my three years of internal medicine, that I would become an intensive care doctor. Well, this required further training. And once again, I decided, you know, it was a good idea to go away uh, from where I had been, nothing wrong with it, but I wanted to kind of just refresh myself in another setting. And this time, I also realized that I was interested in doing some research, not just clinical work, but research. By the way, I had done re some research as a summer student uh, between my undergraduate uh, at UBC and medical school and after first year medical school. And I really enjoyed this, the scientific approach of doing experiments to help answer questions of things we don't yet know in, in science. And so I decided to do what's called a fellowship. That is the next stage of training after internal medicine in a center that had a very strong research focus. And so that happened to be at the University of California, San Francisco, just uh, up the coast from Los Angeles. And so I moved to San, I, I applied and was successful in getting into uh, that training program. And it was a training program that was combined lung disease and critical care. Critical care is the same as intensive care. Uh, and, and I really enjoyed that program. I learned how to take care of those kinds of patients and particularly during the two years that I spent in a lab there as a research trainee, I learned a lot about the scientific method, how to generate a hypothesis, how to test that hypothesis using feasible methods, how to collect data, how to analyze data, and then how to publish results in peer-reviewed journals, that is journals that are reviewed by other scientists. And I really enjoyed that aspect and so I decided to pursue a career as an academic, meaning a person who does both clinical work and research work and of course along with both of those is teaching. Teaching about clinical work and teaching about research. Well, my home was Vancouver and I wanted to come back to Vancouver. My family uh, is here in Vancouver and I, I was once again successful in applying for a position at the University of British Columbia and at St. Paul's Hospital. So I did clinical work in the intensive care unit at St. Paul's Hospital and I did that for 30 years. And at the same time, I did research work. So in this case, I continued some of my work that I was doing in San Francisco. That was basic science, physiology, studying how organs function, in this case, how the lung functions. And this involved work in animals. It was, we did work in uh, sheep and pigs that were anesthetized and cared for very carefully to ensure that there was no suffering in these animals. And I just tell you that, you know, there are many questions in science that can't be addressed in a test tube or on a computer. You need to do experiments in living beings to see if they work in humans. And so that's exactly um, what I was doing for uh, the beginning of my career. I also did some work in cell biology, growing cells in, in petri plates and studying uh, some aspects of, of cell biology. And I enjoyed that, 
But then as I started working in the uh, doing clinical work, I realized there are a lot of opportunities to improve the care of our patients and the processes of care. Things were inefficient. For example, when we wanted to look at x-rays in the morning in the, in the intensive care unit, we had to wait hours before they, they, the images were ready to look at, and that slowed down our care in the, in, the, uh, in the ICU. And so I worked on a project to help improve that. And what I did was I learned about what's called quality improvement. This is a scientific approach to improving processes of anything. Could be care, could be education, used in a lot of industries, in fact, long before it was used in healthcare. But I did some reading and found out that there were some innovators who were using quality improvement, testing it in healthcare. And I got on board by attending some courses and I actually went back to school part-time. I did a master's in epidemiology. Epidemiology is the science of the distribution and determinants of disease. And in that program, my master's program in epidemiology, I learned not only basics of that distribution and determinants of disease, but also statistics, health economics, decision analysis, how to make, how to make decisions, and a variety of other courses that prepared me to do more work in process improvement, healthcare process improvement. And so I switched my research emphasis from basic science, that is animal physiology and cell biology, to what's called health services research. And that in included things like clinical trials, testing certain, uh, drug A versus drug B or treatment A versus treatment B. But it also involved looking at uh, databases of existing data that we collect already in the hospital to look at trends to see what kind of patients are admitted to ICU or what happens to people after they leave the ICU. What can we, and to understand things that we could do better to improve their outcomes. And this got me into the area of patient safety. Patient safety is one area, one aspect of quality of care. Quality of care includes effectiveness of treatments, timeliness of treatments, and acceptability of treatments to, to patients and their families, but it also includes safety. Because uh, safety is a big issue, there are a lot of adverse events in healthcare, way more than there are, for example, in the aircraft industry or railroad industry, or nuclear power industry. They're very safe industries. But healthcare has a lot of adverse events, and many of them are preventable. And so I spent time learning and practicing how to improve care and prevent adverse events. Along the way, I realized that it's not just so simple just to tell people to do the right thing. In fact, the way people work together has a strong influence on whether they deliver safe and effective care. That's teamwork. And so I started learning about the workplace. And the workplace in includes measures such as organizational culture, what it's like to work in a, in a, in a hospital or in an, or an intensive care unit. And you can measure those things. That includes things like communication, teamwork, leadership, those problem solving. These are all measurable aspects of teamwork. And so my research moved into that area of organizational culture. And while I was learning about organizational culture, I also learned about some of the issues that pertain to healthcare workers themselves, issues around wellness of healthcare workers. And one of those issues is called moral distress. That is the distress that people feel when they're caught between what they think they ought to do, what their conscience tells them to do, what their heart says to do, and what somebody else tells them to do. Now, this may happen to you, for example, sometimes at home, maybe you feel like you want to do something and your parents or Somebody else says, no, you can't do that. You have to do it this way. And you're kind of stressed about that. Well, this does happen in healthcare, And it happens related to care of patients where, for example, a nurse feels that maybe a patient is not getting better. And in an intensive care unit where we provide life support, the nurse may feel, gee, this life support isn't really helping. It's just hurting this patient to be having to be on these machines and the tubes in their mouth and their veins and arteries, etc. Maybe we should just allow nature to take its course because we're not helping despite our best attempts. But then somebody else on the team says, no, no, let's push on. 
or sometimes the family wants to push on, but maybe they don't understand everything that's going on. So there's a lot of tensions. We call these conflicts, moral conflicts. And that creates not just a curious psychological phenomenon, but people actually quit, quit the workplace because of that. Did you know it costs about $100,000 to train an ICU nurse to become an ICU nurse? And if an ICU nurse quits his or her job because of a preventable cause of moral distress, that's a real disaster in my opinion, an avoidable disaster. And so my current work, as I near the end of my uh, professional career, is to understand more about moral distress and related wellness measures like burnout and coping skills in healthcare workers. And so uh, I've done some work related, related to surveys of uh, intensive care unit physicians and other uh, ICU professionals, medical students, residents, that is those trainees, postgraduate trainees, because this problem actually occurs even early on in medical school, not just in practicing physicians or nurses. And so the idea is to find out, well, what are the causes of this and what can we do to intervene? And so that's where we're at right now, just try to understand, trying to understand the causes. Now, I think um, I've told you uh, there's been some recurring themes in my career. And one of them is to be inspired by some mentors. And mentorship is so important. I encourage you to find mentors. Uh, if you see people that you really are kind of excited by and you like the way they work, you think that you can see that they're excited by their work, learn more. Talk to them. Get to know them. Secondly, if you have a chance to go away for different phases of your education, I highly recommend it. I know that not everybody can do it, but it's such a refreshing and invigorating thing to do to start fresh in a new place with new people, new ideas. And the third thing is to find and follow your passion. You need to try different things. It's not just a magical thing that you'll find your passion. But if you try different things and be open to different things, you will find something that really turns you on both in terms of what you want to do for a career. And you can change during your career like I did. I changed from being a physiologist studying animals to a health services researcher studying distress in healthcare workers. And that's just fine. It's okay to evolve over time. And above all, I encourage you to work with nice people. I, uh, I say that because, uh, unfortunately, sometimes not everybody is easy to work with. Uh, and the important thing is to try and find the nicest people to work with. It's hard enough doing good science or taking care of patients and doing a good job. Uh, and it's so important to make sure that your working environment, the people you work with, are nice people. Well, that's a short trip through my career. and. I hope that helps you to think about healthcare and perhaps academic healthcare as a potential career for you.